Christmas, it's like the day after New Year's. Ooh, I overslept. What? You made promises, uh, promises that you haven't kept. Promises to who? The commenters, uh, you made a promise to the commenters long ago. I don't know the commenters' shit. What are you talking about? I'm on break, man. A promise is a promise. Ooh. You owe them the stug, Anna. The commenters want the stug. I don't know shit about the stug. I haven't done any research yet. I've been fucking sitting around here doing nothing. How am I supposed to learn all that in, like, now? If you will not make the video yourself, then you will come with me. Do not resist, Anna. I will take you through time and space. I will show you the show, and we will make the video together. Hey, what are you doing? Hey, no, Do no, no, no. Stay away. Do Stay away. Resist. Oh, God. This is for your own good. You owe them. As with all good stories, ours begins with a man. Eric von Manstein, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, is the first in German context to bring up the idea of a mobile howitzer on paper in 1935. Although he does mention its anti-tank potential, he implies it so to be secondary to its main role of mobile artillery, literally called Sturm artillery. In fact, throughout the war, the Stug was associated with artillery battalions and not actually considered a tank within the panzer arm. For the first few years, Stugs weren't even crewed by tankers, but artillerymen. It was designed specifically with infantry support in mind. According to Instructions for the Employment of Sturm Artillery, the morale effect of the Stug was also legitimately considered, saying, quote, Support for the infantry in attack is the chief mission of the assault gun by virtue of its armor. The moral support which the infantry receives through its presence is important. It also interestingly mentions the Stug as open-topped, quote, it does not fire on the move. In close fighting, it is vulnerable because its sides are light and it is open-topped." End quote. This is most likely due to the extremely thin top and side armor. Most people think of the US when they think of open-top TDs, but Germany did just as much of it. Pretty much all of their hull-mounted TDs and assault guns were heavily armored from the front and almost paper-thin from the sides, top, and rear. Military history visualized echoes this sentiment. Could have been open as well. I mean, the, the American tank destroyers were top open yeah. sometimes. The Germans all the time experimented with open designs by necessity. So actually, it's kind of a luxury in 1943 that they at least got paper thin armor, but they got it. It's decided to build this mobile gun on the chassis of the also in development Panzer III. And while 1936-37 prototypes of the Stug were built on the Panzer III Ausf B, the final production models used the Panzer III Ausf F as their base. Don't bother asking me the differences. I didn't bother to look. The Stug remained in a rather long development period up until 1939, and four battalions worth were up and running by 1940 for the invasion of France. Its performance proves to be extremely impressive, pretty much immediately solidifying its role in the German army. 
Hitler specifically loves all the praise he's hearing about it from his generals. It would continue to see service in North Africa, the Balkans, and the invasion of the Soviet Union as the variants Alf A through E. But in 1942, Hitler brings up the idea of putting the Panzer IV's long 75 on the Stug, accentuating its possible use in the anti-tank role. This results in the Alf F and G, using the L-43 and L-48 guns respectively. The Alf G with the L-48 is ultimately chosen as the go-to variant, so much so that once the G is put into production, Germany ceases to make the Alf F or any of the short 75 variants after. Pretty much from 1943 onwards, Alf G is the Stug. Production skyrockets higher than any other German tank. It was the German mass-produced tank. Hitler loves the Alf G so much, he pushes the Stug into the tank destroyer role very quickly, and even begins assigning it to panzer battalions. He demands an upgrade to 80mm of frontal armor, and work begins on a 10.5cm howitzer variant in order to replace the gap filled by the Stug becoming a TD. This would become known as the... Stug. In comparison to other German tanks, the Stug really does put their production numbers to shame, with around 10,000 built, compared to around 8,000 Panzer IVs, 6,000 Panthers, 1,350 Tiger Ones, and 5,775 Panzer Threes. How about that? A support variant of a tank that had more produced than the tank it's derived from, by a pretty large amount. So, why is this? I was certainly rather surprised to find just how much the Germans love this damn thing. After all, on the surface, it really doesn't seem that special. It's essentially the 105mm Howitzer Sherman in function, at first, then pushed into a tank destroyer role and ends up more like an M10 or an M18. Except that had way more armor and speed and mobility wasn't really its strong suit. Either way, so why all the attention? Well, to put it simply, the Stug was cheap. It was way easier and cheaper to produce a tank without a turret than a tank with one, duh. You don't need to worry about traverse mechanisms, turret ring diameter, having the gun block access to parts on the engine deck if the turret is facing backwards, things getting lost in the turret monster, cramped crew space, and it's generally just easier to weld up a large superstructure than to shape a turret. Minus a crew member due to lack of bow machine gun, meaning for every four tanks you can have the men to crew a whole new tank, plus a lower silhouette, there were a lot of advantages to turretless tanks. And when considering the Stug is cheaper to make than a regular Panzer III or IV with the gun of a Panzer IV, it's not hard to see why the Stug was so loved. Now, unlike my guide to the Sherman video, where I had a segment to go through all the rules and general consistencies we could use to provide context as we went through all the variants, there's no such consistency with the Stug. I've heard before that German tank production was a bit of a mess, but man, coming over from American tanks where upgrades and changes are tested, approved, deployed, and standardized in mass on all models, creating uniformity even in change, researching the Stug has been an eye-opening experience, and I honestly can't imagine how much worse it gets for the tanks Germany didn't mass produce. As such, there's no neat segue here, let's just jump into the variants. Starting off with the Stug Ausf A. In comparison to a regular Panzer III Ausf F, it has the same hull, same suspension, with a slightly different transmission to make room for the lower mounted gun. One less crew than a Panzer III has a commander, loader, gunner, and driver with no bow machine gunner. Used the Maybach HL 120 TRM 12 cylinder petrol engine. The engine was mounted in the rear with drive sprockets at the front. Thankfully, these are some features that never change between any of the Stugs. The Alst A used the 75mm Stug 37 L24 short barreled gun, very similar to the Panzer IV's early guns. The Stug III also had thicker armor than Panzer III's. It was an assault gun, and accentuating its armor was actually a pretty big deal. It had 50mm at the front and 30mm at the rear, as opposed to the 30mm at the front and 21mm on the rear of the Panzer III, but both tanks had 30mm of armor on the sides. For unknown reasons, 20 Stug A's were built using the Panzer III G chassis between the main Stug A production run and the start of Stug B production run. Still had 30mm front plates, so additional 20mm plates were just bolted on. Driver visibility was poor. The front vision slit that had to be closed when being shot at, forcing the driver to use a twin periscope. They still had the left side driver slit though, which I always thought was kind of useless, but upon having the opportunity to use them in the new armored update for postscriptum, turns out they actually come in clutch. Unless the tank has Schrutzen. At least they should. Oh, the periscope is definitely a bit different. Oh, haha, <laughs> <Yeah>. great. <laughs> My additional viewport that is on the left side of the tank is completely blocked by the Schrutzen. The driver also doesn't even have a hatch. 
The commander had the iconic scissor periscopes, but could only use it if the hatch was open. Stug aus A's were first issued in February of 1940, with 24 in service by the end of May, used to equip Sturm artillery batteries and took part in the French campaign in May and June of 1940. Despite what War Thunder would tell you, they weren't used to shoot at tanks. Yet. Five prototype tanks were produced in 1937, with 31 series tanks made between January and May of 1940. In February of 1940, the name was changed from s pac to 7.5cm Canon PZSFL, which translates to Armored Self-Propelled 75mm Gun. Then, almost immediately afterwards, in March, it was changed again to Sturmgeschutz, meaning Assault Gun. This is the name that would finally stick till the end of the war. But even then, its official designation in manuals was, um, uh, which was thankfully abbreviated into, oh god, fuck me, can I go back to American tanks? Quick little identification tips, the OSF A had the sides of the superstructure level with the sides of the hull, leaving the track guards clear. This is something that changes between some of the variants. An armored pannier was installed on the left track guard. And it also had a very recognizable commander sight cut out on the superstructure with this wacky ribbed pattern. Once you see it, you'll never not notice it. The Stug Ausf B. Most upgrades for the Ausf B were carried over from the changes made in the Panzer III Ausf F to H, such as the track width change from 36 centimeters to 40 centimeters, which also ended up changing the whole running gear of the tanks. Some Ausf Bs had six spoke sprockets, plus an eight spoke idler for the wider tracks. This is the main difference between the Ausf A and B, but even this isn't a guarantee. The Ausf B had an improved ignition system, with a synchro mesh transmission replacing the pre-selective type used in the Ausf A. Same engine, same gun, and same armor as the Ausf A otherwise. A total of 320 Ausf Bs were produced between June and May of 1941. Most first saw combat in the Balkans in 1941, and some took part in the invasion of the Soviet Union. The Stug Ausf B was known as the 2 and 3 series. The Ausf C. The Ausf C saw minor improvements from the Ausf B, such as mounting skulls, Okay, around the steering brake access hatches, a modified idler wheel, and oil bath engine air filters. Whatever those are. Most important, though, was the replacement of the direct vision port of the gunner sight, replaced by a periscopic SFL ZF1 gun sight, which could be raised through a small hole in the gunner's roof hatch. This also allowed for a minor superstructure redesign, which would remove the ribbed cutout seen on the Ausf A and B. 50 Ausf C Stugs were produced between May and September of 1941, known as the 4 series. The Stug Ausf D. Very similar to the Ausf C. In fact, much to my dismay, as kind of the whole point of this series is to give you all the knowledge to tell these tanks apart with visuals alone, it's identical to the Ausf C. Although, I have been able to find images of Ausf Cs that were retrofitted with the longer 75mm cannon. But for some reason, I don't think this ever happened with the Ausf D or even the E. Why? Well, either way, if you find a Stug that has all the features of an Ausf C or D, but has the longer 75, it's probably an Ausf C retrofit. Otherwise, the Ausf D was produced with face-hardened armor, and a signal bell was installed for the commander to get the attention of the driver. What's that? Three bells! Well, we all know what three bells means! Sadly, it's not actually a bell. I got really excited when I read that at first, but did the research and it's like a little electrical signal thingy. In fact, a lot of other sources just refer to it as an internal intercom system, so... That was pretty disappointing, I'm not gonna lie. No! In order for some Stug Ds to be used as command vehicles, an armored pannier was installed on the right side as well on some Stugs, which might help tell the difference between the D and the C, but even this is inconsistent. I don't get it. This is the only real practical change between the Off C and D, and it's not even standardized. Speaking of side storage bins, this is also a big tell of the Off A through D, which have these angled side armor panels something that has dropped from the Ausf E onwards. 150 Stug Ausf Ds were produced between May and September of 1941, and then more in March of 1942, mainly produced to make up for the 105 loss throughout the year in 1941. The Stug D was known as the 5 series. The Stug Ausf E, similar to the Ausf C and D, I'm noticing a pattern here, finally standardized the installation of the right side pannier. Hooray! and an increase to the size of the left side pannier, significantly increasing stowage and ammo capacity. This change was made because platoon leaders stopped using SDKFZ 253s and instead started commanding from Stugs. A smart decision. Track guards also needed to be resized due to the pannier changes, and the 8mm of slanted armor was removed. Or as the chieftain likes to say, deleted. 
The Ops E was mainly to replace losses suffered on the Eastern Front, and by July of 1943, only 37 shortgun Stugs were still in combat. 500 Ops E were ordered, but only 284 were built until they just moved on to the Ops F. The Stug Ops E was known as the 6 Series. The Stug Ops F finally getting into the long 75mm gun territory, this being with the L43. Included a protruding armored housing for the roof-mounted exhaust fan on the top, which is a very good identifier. During production of the Ops F, from late 1942 into 43 and onwards, 30mm plates were added to the front to increase the armor. The two headlights on the Stug were also removed from this point on. So make note, if you see a Stug without headlights, it is most likely a late model F or a G. And although I claim the Ops F with the L43 gun, the L48 was eventually put on the later production series. You may have heard of Stug 3 Ops F 8s. These are variants that were produced with the Panzer 3J hull, known as the um, Zugführerwagen version 8 hull. Pardon me if I butchered that. Now, I have looked far and wide for a difference between these two tanks but all I found is the claim that it was armored slightly better in the rear, and it had towing hook holes extended from the sidewalls. But I have yet to verify any of this visually. 359 of these tanks were produced between March and September of 1942, resulting in the Stug Ausf F 6 and 7 series. Finally, the Stug Ausf G. Adoption of a completely new superstructure with 30mm slanted sides and 50mm plates at the front. And the side of the superstructure overlaps with the top of the track. There's these little segments on the side that kind of jut out. This is the ultimate identifier of an Ausf G. It is unique to the G and it is not on anything else. So if you see these little side panels here, these little side extra bits, 100% an Ausf G. If you need more identifiers though, the Ausf G saw the introduction of the Commander's Cupola, so unless it's some sort of Ausf D, E, or F that was retrofitted, a Commander's Cupola means a Stug G. The iconic scissor periscope that we've all come to know and love could be raised through the hinged port in the forward edge hatch of the lid, so no longer having to open your hatch, but as they take one step forward, they take another step back with the gunner's roof hatch being removed for a periscope. The Stug Ops G saw many other changes. The angle of the side panels was increased. A hinged armored gun shield was placed on the roof of the tank. In February of 1943, smoke throwers were added, but were removed in May after it was discovered they could be set off by small arms fire. Armored Schertzen were added in April of 43, and in May of 43, the 50mm and 30mm bolted armor plates were replaced with just a 80mm thick armored plate, as well as a new muzzle brake was installed. The Coppola was also up armored in late 43. Late 43 also saw the change from a square mantlet to the rounded one, also known as the pig nose mantlet. In March of 1944, a mount for a remote controlled MG34 was installed, controlled by the loader with a periscope. However, the gun couldn't be belt fed, so the loader still had to pop up out of the tank to reload the damn thing. May of 1944 also saw the installation of. God fucking damn it. A, a close range defense weapon capable of firing small grenades. The Stug Ausf G was produced from December of 1942 to March of 1945, with 7,720 total produced, making it by far the most favored and most produced variant of the Stug. Overall, the Stug saw an extremely quick development between 1941 and 1942, going all the way through pretty much every variant. From 1943 onwards, it's safe to assume a vast majority of Stugs on the field were Ausf Gs. As I mentioned in the previous chapter, the Germans, and Hitler specifically, loved the Stug. Its combat reports came back extremely positive, it was well liked by the troops, it was cheap, it was reliable, and I think it really paved the way for a lot of the wackier German tanks that would be seen later in the war. Specifically, tanks like the Hetzer. It's no huge secret that Hitler was a big fan of these hull-mounted, extremely well-angled, low-profile tank destroyer designs. And I don't think it's a coincidence that before the Stug, we had tanks like the Panzer IV, Panzer III, and Panzer 38Ts. Then after the Stug, we get the Jagdpanzer IV, the Jagdpanther, and the Hetzer. Because the Stug showed Hitler and Germany that you can make an effective tank with these designs. Although, the Germans weren't the only ones to live the Stug life. The Stug saw service with some of the countries that had hopped onto Uncle Hitler's wild ride, such as Italy, but also many others like Spain and later Syria. But perhaps the most notable was the Finnish, who continued to use Stugs for quite a while, and made the significant modification of additional concrete armor. That's how you ended up with these more rounded off Stugs. This was not a German decision, and is a clear indicator of a Finnish Stug. Now, I've also tried to look at examples of Spanish and Syrian Stugs for identifiers, but all I could find was a Syrian Stug with some sort of 
definitely not German machine gun on top, and this wacky looking Spanish prototype Stug for launching rockets. But even better, along my journey to find wacky Stugs, I came across this. Yes, that is correct. What you are looking at is an Estats Stug. You know, that thing they tried to do with the Panther to disguise it as an American M10? They did that with some Stugs too. As if the Panther already looked nothing like an M10, what American tank was this supposed to look like? The Americans famously never used hull-mounted tank destroyers, literally one of the only countries to not do so. They legitimately could not have picked a worse tank to disguise as American. I seriously have no fucking idea what they were thinking. I just... I... I need a fucking break. Roll over to the next chapter, please. The Stug is a confusing case for me. I don't really understand a lot of the decisions made by the Germans in regards to this tank and what it was supposed to do. The Stug was a good tank, clearly it suited the Germans well, but I don't understand why the Germans never treated it as such. Throughout the entire war, the Stug was associated with the artillery. It wasn't a tank. This distinction is important, and in my opinion, one of the greatest mistakes the Germans ever made in regards to this vehicle. Now, the German army can be roughly categorized into two pieces, the panzer arm and the infantry. The panzer arm was to contain, well, the panzers. It was a force separate to the infantry which was to utilize its mobility to take advantage of the Blitzkrieg doctrine. In German doctrine, the panzer arm could operate completely independently unless they were close enough to an infantry division in which the panzer division would then fall under control of the infantry. Now, on paper, this is actually a pretty smart way to do it. Let the panzers run ahead, blitz through the enemy line, spearhead the attack, and create an opening. Then, let the infantry catch up, and suddenly, all the tanks that could operate on their own and do what they thought was necessary to initiate the offensive are now under the command of the infantry, who are now exploiting that opening. Now, the infantry can take direct control of the tanks and use them how they need to, it's like having a bulldog on a leash. I release the dog and let him run ahead and rip a hole in your leg to immobilize you. Then once I catch up, I can rein him back in and put him on my leash, then kick the crap out of you while you're on the floor. But there was one problem with this, and Dunkirk was the perfect showing of how this tactic can go wrong. The Panzers didn't want to be under the control of the infantry. The bulldog, once let off its leash, is just gonna keep running and ripping holes into people's legs. I can run after it all I want, but at the end of the day, it's a dog. It can run faster. This was Dunkirk in a nutshell. Quite literally, the Panzers kept running because they knew that if they let the infantry catch up, the infantry could keep them at their side for the rest of the offensive and the spearhead's momentum would be lost. Now, this isn't the Panzer arm having any sort of resentment or hate for the infantry, but rather the Panzers thought they knew what was better, to keep pushing. And it wasn't until halt orders came down from Hitler himself that they actually listened. Now, why do I bring this up? Well, it's to show the distinction between the panzer arm and the infantry, and it provides context as to why the Stug ended up the way it did. The Stug was not a tank. It wasn't supposed to move with the panzer arm. It was to stay with the infantry to act as a mobile artillery piece. That's why you have tanks like the Panzer IV D. That was a tank, even though it pretty much had the same or at least similar role to the Stug. That was supposed to be in the panzer arm and act as an anti-infantry measure with the other tanks, like the Panzer 38 Ts and others, which were the more conventional tanks. It pretty much explains why the Stug was left out of so many conversations. Even as a tank destroyer in function in its later life, the Stug was not a tank in the eyes of the Germans. It stayed as artillery, even after being assigned to panzer divisions. Also explains why the name was never changed. For many tanks that change roles, the name is also changed, but the Stug was always a Stug. This also explains why we see tanks like the Jagdpanzer IV and the Hetzer. Why bother with these if you have the Stug? Because these are tanks. The Stug wasn't. This was a Stumgeschutz, a mobile gun. These were tank destroyers, Jagdpanzers. Even though the Stug could perform both infantry support and tank destroying in its two variants, the Panzer Arm still had to waste time and resources developing separate TDs and anti-infantry vehicles. So I don't get it. If the Stug is so much better, then why the Panzer IV? Can't these two vehicles serve the same purpose? <sighs> Not really. Obviously, you can't have a turretless tank be the main tank of your army. Even the Swedes agree with that. Plus, the Stug excelled in ambush tactics. It was best utilized on the defensive when you could lure the enemy into a trap or ambush an advancing force. 
It was better on the attack as an assault gun, but was better on the defensive as a tank destroyer. I mean, hell, even the Americans figured tank destroyers would be better on the defensive anyways, but they knew this from the very beginning and designed their tank destroyers as such. The Germans had all these different tanks that were great at super specific situations within their broader function. All of these tanks are tank destroyers in function, but none of them could be used in interchangeable situations, at least not to the best of their abilities. Instead of having one tank that was pretty okay at everything, then developing variants that performed more niche functions, the Germans just straight built a new tank for every function. Now, of course, there are exceptions, but generally, this is what I'm taking from all this. Not even considering the amount of changes each tank could go through during its lifetime, it really paints a picture of just how backwards the production mindset of Germany was. Potential History acknowledges this plenty in his videos on German tankery too, and makes a much bigger point on Germany's blind obsession with waging offensive wars and producing equipment as such, even in 1944 when the Germans are clearly on the defensive, developing tanks like the Sturm Tiger. I recommend you watch his videos to get a better feel on that side of it. But it's been really fascinating to see the difference between American and German production figures. All the numbers are so low. When researching for the Sherman, each variant had thousands produced. Even on vehicles that had short production runs, you're always dealing with a few thousand. But with Germany, an entire model of Stug can have less than 500 built, some less than 100. Of course, the comparison isn't really fair, since each model of Stug contains such slight differences, where Sherman models had decently major changes, but still, it really puts into perspective the production mindset of the two nations. When thinking about the M4A4, the model of Sherman that was the last into production and the first to be stopped, there were still almost 7,500 built. Yet for the Stug, which is the most produced vehicle in the whole German army, even the variants that stuck around, like the Ausf G, barely matched that. It honestly gives me a bit of respect for Germany. They really didn't have much to work with, and yet they achieved some pretty world-changing results. The Americans alone outproduced the entire Stug family of tanks with one model of Sherman. Subtract all other Shermans, just this one model, and America already wins on volume. And the Sherman had no corners cut, no turret to be removed, it wasn't made out of some sort of shortage of parts or simplification of production of a other tank that already existed. In fact, if anything, it was supposed to be a more complicated version of the tank that had come before it. And once you add in Russian and British production figures, I'm genuinely amazed the Germans managed to hold out as long as they did. Of course, the Germans made other models of tanks, and it's much easier to look at an overall production chart of these countries rather than take every tank they ever made and compare the numbers one to one. But it's so easy to look at a chart like this and just say, oh yeah, sure, the Americans and Russians outproduced the Germans. But when you really dive into the minutia here, looking at each model of tank and compare the numbers, you realize just how much Germany was in over their heads. By 1943, 37 shortgun Stugs were in service. Only 37. Now I know, they had been replaced by Stugs with the longer 75. But if we take an American comparison, the M3 Lee, a tank that was produced in late 41 and was pretty much obsolete by 42, in fact, you could make the argument that the Lee was obsolete upon arrival, and by 1943, there were still hundreds of Lees running around, long after the switch to the M4 had been standardized. Once again, I can only imagine Soviet numbers paint an even worse picture. Look, even as I'm typing this out on my script, I understand comparing the Stug to a Sherman or Lee might not be that fair, at least in terms of what the two tanks were supposed to do. But my point is, even taking the single model of tank the Germans produced the most of the entire war, it still pales in comparison to even a sub-variant of an American or Russian tank. I guess the Germans make up for it with just the sheer number of models they made. Either way, this has really been my first foray into German tankery, especially on such a deep level, and I've learned a lot, and it's really been putting a lot of my previous research into perspective. This has been a real Christmas treat. Hopefully this video has been able to help some of you genuinely identify variants of Stug just based on looks alone. But with that, I think there's nothing left than to say thank you all for watching. This year has been, um, a lot of new things have happened to me this year, such as starting a YouTube channel and gaining a hefty 1,350 odd subscribers. And let me just say, that's pretty awesome. So before this video gets any longer, I'm gonna go ahead and end her here. Thank you all so much again for watching. Have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And I will see you all in the next video. This has been a slightly confusing guide to the Stug. My name is Etta320. Thank you for watching.